But I worked out and the Catch and Live Foundation really helped us all. Everyone that was in my group had made great strides from it. I feel good. And like Cal's program is a big part of that and all that different stuff with the coach's corner and, and having coaches or having different things. Use all of it, whatever you need, use it to get you to where you need to be. And Thank you for tuning in to the Catch a Lift Funds Coach's Corner podcast. We hope you enjoy today's episode and will consider supporting the Catch a Lift Fund and the veterans we serve. Visit our website for more information about our programs at catchaliftfund.org. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis or suicidal thoughts, please call 988 or the Veterans Crisis Line 988, followed immediately by the number one. The views and opinions expressed during the Coach's Corner podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the Catch a Lift Fund. The Catch a Lift Fund does not verify or warrant the truth or accuracy of statements made during the podcast, and statements therein are not to be construed as an official policy or position of the Catch a Lift Fund. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein should be construed as health, medical, or other professional advice. The Coach's Corner is a place for veterans to connect, heal, and share their stories. I'm Melissa Luke, the host of the Coach's Corner podcast. I am a U.S. Army Iraq War veteran, coach, and program director for the Catch a Lift Fund. The Coach's Corner is sponsored by ID Technologies. Welcome to this week's episode of the Coach's Corner. Please join me in welcoming Cal veteran athlete and U.S. Marine Corps veteran Quintel Saunders to the show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Coach's Corner. Quintel, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much. Oh, it's going to be fun today, Quintel. We're excited <laughs> to talk to you. Let's get right into it. Quintel, if you don't mind, talk to us a little bit about your life growing up and what would lead you to the Marine Corps. Uh, so I'm a first generation Virginian. My family migrated down in the early 80s from New York. And so um, growing up in Virginia, um, you know, there was ups and downs. Um, you know, my family got divorced or my mother and my father got divorced there, um, which led us down to Atlanta, Georgia when I was in high school. So I struggled a little bit, um, you know, not having my stepfather around who was, you know, a strong male presence in my life. And then, you know, getting readjusted to the new life in, in, in Atlanta and then growing up in high school at the same time. So I was an Air Force ROTC, and my ROTC instructors swore I was going to the Air Force. I thought I was going to the Air Force, yeah. but, you know, those Marine Corps recruiters, man, I tell you what, they could sell water to a well. So um, <laughs> so basically, I was taking my ASVAB for the Air Force. Um, I knew at the end of high school I needed to go somewhere. I just right. felt like it was in college. And uh, as I was taking the ASVAB for the second time, um, I just really felt like, all right, you know, maybe something inside is pulling me towards the Marine Corps. And that's what I ended up doing. So Wonderful. Uh, Quintel, what job specialty did you enter the Marine Corps with? So, and we talked about this before. It's a little bit of a funny story. So a lot of Marines, or you, you probably know this in, in your time in the service too, sometimes we just go in and pick a job. Yeah. And yep. The recruiters say, hey, you can change it when you get in. <laughs> that's, remember, a, that's a famous line, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So I said, you know, um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I did think I wanted to be a tough guy and do infantry or do other things. And so, but um, I decided um, that I still wanted to be in the reserves just in case I wanted to go back in school. Right. So I picked food service because I thought, I, to be honest, I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to cook as a reservist yeah. and I'll just change it when I get in. I remember in boot camp, we came in from somewhere and in the squad bay, we seen everybody up getting thrashed, uh, quarter decked, mountain climbers, sweat everywhere. And I'm whispering to the recruits. I said, well, what, what are they up there for? What do they do? And they said, well, these are all the recruits that uh, their recruiters told them that they could change their jobs in boot camp. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I said, you know, I I'll be good with food service for now. Yeah. But later on down the line, my job did change. 
Quintel, what do you remember most about training up as a young Marine? Uh, well, one, it was excitement and very intimidating at the same time. Uh, a lot of times we do things to define ourselves or what is it becoming an adult? And for me, I'm like, what is, what is it that I could do to become a man? Um, since, um, you know, I really didn't have those examples around me during the time, I felt like the military was the best thing. Um, and also it was very intimidating because, you know, the day that I qualified on the rifle range was also the same day that 9-11 happened. No kidding. So, oh my yeah. Gosh. And so, wow, wow. you know, you know, it really kicked in for lack of a better term that it got real and, right. you know, I'm going to probably do what I signed up to do. So. That's incredible. Uh, and just to speak to, to 9-11 a little bit, it's so interesting, right? Because everybody kind of has a little bit of a different 9-11 story, right? And just, you know, what was going on that day, but even how they reacted to it. Um, so like you said, you know, it, it was a wake up call, like this is going to be, you know, this is real and everything now. Um, did the, did the dynamics of the training that you were going through change after 9-11 or did, you know, just kind of day to day, did it seem like there was a shift or was it pretty much like it had been? Well, the, the first shift was mentally, you know, you had a whole bunch of kids in boot camp, and, you know, stories were exaggerated. You know, we first heard that the whole Manhattan Island was blown up. Wow. Then another story, you know, they blew up Washington DC because we don't have right. access. Yeah. TV yep. and things like that. So the mentality changed. And then the same drill instructors that were training us were the same drill, instruct drill instructors that also had to take a role of comforting. And that sounds okay. weird because you don't think, you, I know you don't remember your drill instructors as comforting right. people. Right. You yep. know, and so they had to put on a hat to where, okay, we got to make sure that these guys are okay with their morale, but at the same time, we still got training to do. Yeah. Which was very interesting. That is. Um, Quintel, how long of a period would it be until you would deploy to Iraq? So that was 2001. Our first wave went in 2003. And what happened in between those times was that the Marine Corps decided that they wanted to take on the job. As back then, it started off as mortuary affairs. And so um, from two, we're around maybe we heard rumors in 2002 that we would be going. And then... Okay. At the end of 2002, we find out that uh, us and two other uh, reserve units were going to be deployed as mortuary affairs. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. What was your first thought when you heard that? Or what were you thinking? To be quite honest with you, um, what did I get myself into? Yeah, you know, right. Uh, I didn't, you know, you think about war, you think about um, the possibility of seeing casualties, but you didn't think that. I never thought that I would be on the front lines doing it. Right. Um, and you automatically, you know, what do you call it? Rumination. You think about it over and over and over again about it, what it's going to be like. But it's never like how you think about it. Yeah. Um, I really had to grow up really fast and also rely on resources and other relationships um, very quickly. And... Um, I guess strongly for a lack of a better term, right. but, um, it, it was, it was one of the most interesting transitions that I've ever been through in my life. I can't even imagine that's a, I just would have to think that'd be, be such a shock, right. You know, before yeah. that deployment like that, um, just trying to put myself in that, what that would have been like. So I want to talk about a couple things with you Q before we get into Iraq itself. So, um, would you touch on for us some of the unique challenges training up to go to war as a reservist mm -hmm. and then talk to us to Q about training. Like how did you prepare for more for a position like mortuary affairs going into Iraq? What was that preparation like? Well, being a reservist already is challenging because you're not full time. Right. Um, you know, you, you earn the respect and sometimes there's a lack of respect. Sometimes it's self-inflicted. Sometimes it's just based on a person's relationship with right. reservists versus active duty. So there's a versus because the military overall is very competitive. Um, yes. And when we got the news that what we would be transitioning to and with the jobs, telling our families. So they went. So we knew as the transition happened, we're definitely going. It's no way that you okay. can be mortuary affairs and not go. 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, we have officers, you know, staff and COs and COs all the way down to, you know, E3 to E1. Some of them had active duty experience, but most of us didn't. So how the training started is we would do at home ATs in Atlanta and we would go down to the morgue. We would watch different videos of, you know, POWs, things that I don't want to use the word desensitize, but it was really all we had at the time to wow. kind of prepare us. Yeah. And then our officers worked it out to where we we were attaching to um, the unit in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina Marine Corps Base. And once we got there, um, the Army, Fort Lee, Virginia, uh, they sent some people down from their Mortuary Affairs headquarters yeah. to train us. And they did a phenomenal job. Uh, we felt at ease. Um, it really didn't get easier, but it got better. Okay. Um, and so it's still, we still understood that once we deployed or got in theater, it would be different. Yeah. But the biggest challenge was, you know, as an E1 or E2 at the time, I don't know much about being active duty, but, and I also don't know nothing about this job. You also looked around and you seen your staff NCOs and your officers what with the with the same experience and also most of us never even been to combat before right so that was very interesting we we got close knit and we had to depend on each other very early and very fast that's incredible thank you for talking to us about that q let's uh let's get into iraq a little bit talk to us about deploying to iraq and what that was like for you and your unit um it was an interesting birthday present uh we got birthday. to iraq february was it on your birthday on, we landed in theater on my birthday. It was, oh my I believe gosh, it, was wow. 20, it was 2005. Um, it's my 22nd birthday, I believe. Okay. Uh, um, 22nd or 23rd, but uh, that's where we landed. And when we landed, wow. uh, my buddy Sawyer, he looked at me and he said, happy birthday, Saunders. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Wow, wow, wow. So, um, and then so we were in the Ambar province, so we had to set up collection points. And so for those who don't know what collection points is, basically collection points are the places where either we go do search and recoveries to retrieve the fallen or they're brought to us. Okay. So that's where we work. And so Fallujah um, was one place. Uh, TQ, uh, Al Takadam is where I was. And the interesting thing about TQ and Fallujah, it's maybe a 30 or 45 minute straight shot drive. But it took three hours if you were taking a convoy because there were so wow. many IEDs on the main right. road. Right. Yep. Um, they got there. We got there. The group that was there before us was actually the ones in Fallujah that actually had to turn one of the, it was either, uh, it was a factory. I can't remember if they produced or, or manufactured or, or distributed potatoes, but it was big. And so the mass casualties, they had to actually use that factory because they ran out of room in their wow. point. Oh, my gosh. So it was Fallujah, Al Takadam, which is TQ, and Al Assad. Um, and we did do search and recoveries to other places. Um, but for the most part, that's where we were. But we did provide um, support. I believe it was Al Qaim on the Syrian border. So um, we were pretty busy. Oh, I can only imagine. So you and I got to talk about this a little bit last time. And, you know, we found out we were there the same time, you know, and it was interesting because yeah. I was, I was with a national guard company and, you know, we were, we were a hat company. And so I went to all those places, right? Like, you know, we would go to, to TQ and Fallujah and, you know, the places you and I talked about. So I'm very familiar with Iraq 2005, right? And especially that greater area. Uh, it was a, a very kinetic time there. And like you said, you know, it might've been a 45 minute straight shot, but right, three hours on a convoy. It was uh, it was nonstop IEDs for us on the road, right? What? You know, it was, um, it was every day. So I can only imagine what that, you know, would have looked like for you as a young Marine doing recoveries. Um, Quintel, you know, looking back or even at the time, what did you find to be the, you know, the hardest or most challenging part of that job working mortuary affairs in Iraq? Well, keep your mind occupied in between the time that we work because you don't want it to set in your mind a lot of the things that you saw and you processed. Um, so in between that times, we had to keep each other active. 
we did make sure we rest the times that we had to rest, but we okay. really, the camaraderie got really strong. Um, some of the best pickup basketball games I've ever been involved in. <laughs> I bet, um, yeah. Word puzzles. Um, you know, some of the things, coloring books. Uh, you know, uh, when you interact with people in the military, you come from all yeah. areas of the United States. Uh, you get to listen to, you get to interact with them with some of the things they grew up with that you weren't used to. And that's one of the things I really appreciated about the military. I got to be a fish out of water, picking up new habits, picking up new interests and doing things that I never thought I would like. That's very and it was cool, all yeah. in, the, in those windows in between those times that really kept us close and it kept us sane, for lack of a better term. That's incredible. Um, how long of a deployment was it for you guys, Q? It was a seven-month deployment, okay. uh, a really interesting seven-month deployment. Um, but uh, how we did it in Mortuary Affairs, I don't know. It's because the Marine Corps, well, at that time, it was only three units. Uh, it was okay. Marietta, Georgia, and Acosta, Maryland, I believe Dayton, Ohio. And so our, our tours were short to keep the rotation corner, to keep enough people, but we, they needed us back home to help train other Marines. Okay. So when we came back home, we actually, uh, here in Marietta, Georgia, we opened up. It's now called PRP, Personal Retrieval, right. Pla uh, Personal Retrieval Platoon. Um, it's only two now, I believe, Quantico, Virginia, and Marietta, Georgia. So, Q, if you don't mind, would you take us through, uh, and you can obviously you know, make it very general, but could you take us through what a day of recovery actually would kind of look like? Um, um, cool. Cool. Uh, so you have different scenarios. Um, one is if say, for example, something happens on base, that's probably brought to us, um, a fallen, it was fallen Marine, well, all fallen armed forces. And then okay. also you had the civilian contractors. And then also you had some Iraqis or people from, you know, the middle Eastern area that, that, you know, took jobs with the government. Right. So any one of those, you know, groups if someone passed away we would be responsible for the process okay. so it was either brought to us or we would do a search and recovery so a search and recovery of course is you're not going to send a group of reservists out there by themselves so yeah. we would attach to probably army mps or okay. marine corps special forces or whatever have you and um basically we would go out we would have the grid coordinates of where um you know the perceived death is and then right. go recover and bring them back of course you have to have the proper equipment you're trained to do that. Um, you know, you have to have strong sanitary habits. Um, once that gets back to the collection point, I was actually the scribe. So I had to do all the paperwork. It was literally, you know, I was writing in my green log book before we got deployed. My staff sergeant said, I love your handwriting. You're the scribe. Oh, you know how you get voluntold. In the yeah, military. yeah. Said, well, it's no problem with that. So I said, man, I, I didn't go to college because I didn't want to do these worksheets. And look at me now. I'm in Iraq filling out these worksheets. Still gotcha, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, you got different forms that you have to process. You process the bodies. What's the reason why? Because we forward them over to Kuwait. The Kuwait people right. in Kuwait does a second inspection. inspection. And then from there, it's Dover, Delaware. And then from Dover, Delaware, back to the families okay. or wherever they, um, the respected areas they are from. Um, in between that process, like I said, um, um, you know, a lot of particular things that you have to do to be sanitary, making sure that you have everything that you need to send home to the family. Because the closure that we got out of it is even though these people are already gone, they serve their country. And the best service we can do is at least give the family some type of closure. Right. And that's bringing those bodies back. Um, you know, at the end of whatever we do when we process those bodies, um, we take them to the flight line, you know, we put them in a, in, a, in a transfer case and we put the flag over and, you know, we have a small ceremony as we're taking them on to the, the C-5 or the C-130, wherever they're going. And so the first few times was challenging because you're like, wow, I'm, I'm literally sending some, I, I wonder how the families are going to react to this. Right. But then after a while, it turned into, you know, that's really none of our business. Let's make sure we can do the, do the best that we can, like I said, to bring some closure to the situation. Quintel, thank you so very much for your service to our great country. Thank you. Something that, that you said to me uh, when we met the first time talking about this show, you said that 
you know, the, the military, they, they prepare you for war, but not to come home. Quintel, what was the hardest challenge for, for you, you know, leaving Iraq, coming back, transitioning back into life here in the U.S.? Um, the world didn't stop. The world yeah. didn't stop. Uh, that seven months was almost like me losing seven years. Um, you know, you had to come home. Like, that was my first year of marriage. My first wedding really? anniversary. Really? Wow. Yeah, my first wedding anniversary okay. was in Iraq. Um, actually, two months, maybe a month or two after we got married, that's when I got the call that we would be deploying within a year. Okay. Um, I come back home, and I'm like, what is my identity? I'm still growing up. I'm still a young man. I'm married. I have responsibilities. All of the care that I needed at the time, I had to pick the option of working because I had to come home and catch up with the world. Um, and that's what I meant about the on and off switch. In addition to that, all of the new baggage that you picked up, you really don't know right away exactly how you're going to, to respond to right. what you saw, yeah. what you had to endure. But when you get, get home and you're in a different environment, and you didn't have that time to properly assess yourself, go through the proper counseling and really just sit down and just tell someone what you went through. You hold that in and then you already got this busy world yeah. you know, that we're in. And so that was some of the greatest challenges because I had to give myself permission. I had to trust people. I had to really find resources and put my pride down. And it's I've been back in 2005 and to this day, I'm still learning how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But I told myself it's okay. It's, it's really okay to do so. So it's, it's interesting, you know, and you know, both of us, you know, as national guard, you were reservists, but, and I've talked to people about this before. It's a much different process, you know, getting ready for the deployment to the war zone. It's, it's a much different, uh, when we get back to the U S you know, and I don't know exactly how yours look like Quintel, but you know, we were, we were there 12 months. We flew back home and, uh, we did our out processing at Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. We were there about two weeks and then we were just, we were cut loose and we had about three months before we had to report back to our unit for another drill weekend. And, um, the unit I deployed with actually was not my unit. I, I volunteered to go with them. I switched MOSs and whatnot. And so I never saw them again. So I came home, did that two week out process. And then it was just back to the world, back to my mm. other unit. And it, it was very bizarre, but I remember very clearly just being like, what the hell am I supposed to do now? Like when that mm. two weeks ended and I had a friend come pick me up at the post, you know, cause I didn't have a vehicle there or anything. And I was literally at the, what am I supposed to do now? Do I go back and stay at my parents' house? Do I get like, I just didn't know what to do. And I also felt that feeling of rushness, right? Because, yeah. um, you know, I left when I was 18. So, you know, I felt like I was a year behind in college or in life or, you know, whatever. And so I jumped right back into that stuff. You know, I got mm -hmm. home in December of 05 and, you know, that spring I was enrolled in, in school and I was trying to, to go back, um, to work and different stuff. And like you said, you don't, you don't know what it's going to be like, right? Until kind of that dust has settled yeah. and, and stuff, it fell apart very, very quickly for me. Yeah. Um, so I definitely, it's, it's, I was interesting because um, it, it looks a little different. I think if you're active duty or, or if you were a reservist kind of going through this stuff. Yeah. What was next for you, Q? Well, it was a lot of bad habits to be totally honest. Uh, it was watching people work out, but not work out. Mentally and physically, I was always drained because I always worked. You work so much two or three jobs because you're looking for that purpose that you had in Iraq. Or when you're deployed, purpose is up here. And then you come home and it's just like you're trying to measure up. Oh, yeah. And even though we went through a lot over there, it's still purpose. You yep, know, we absolutely. Knew what we did, yes. You know, change lives. And so it was, you know, do I work a lot? Then when you work a lot, you don't have much time for yourself. You're yeah. drinking two or three energy drinks a day. You're eating the wrong foods. I remember I was doing loss prevention at Target, and it was a great job because at the time, I just had an eye for catching internal and external theft. Okay. Well, when you come home, you realize that war is not just out there. It's it's home also. You got to deal yeah. with people, you know, having personal opinions, people not yeah. talking to you, people turning away from you because of your war experience. You can't accuse them of anything, but you know that you know, 
that's what it is. And I couldn't understand like, man, it, the cost, there's a cost to freedom, regardless yes. of what you yep. believe there is. Yes. And so depression, anxiety hit, even though my wife was super and still this day, very supportive. But my pathway to hell was paved with good intentions. Yeah. You know, so everything I wanted to do good turned sour because internally I was burning up. Right. And so I gained so much weight. You know, I remember showing you that picture with my daughter before she was one years yeah. old. That's maybe five years after the deployment. And that's maybe 120 pounds heavier than I was when I when I went uh, I really just didn't have that focus and that drive, you know, and so it, w- it was an up and down ride. It, yeah. it, it was. And then I know, you know, um, you know, Melissa, who do we talk to during those times? It's tough. A lot of the things that were here now, like catch a lift, right. catch a lift wasn't out back then. Yep, you know? exactly. Yep. Fortunately for the veterans who got back. Now we've created awareness. Now we're stepping up. Now these things are happening. But back then, some of that stuff wasn't thought of. It's not because people didn't care. It's just what do we do? Yeah, it wasn't built in yet, right? And the other thing is, I mean, the the greater war wars on terror, right? We had never seen we had never seen battle like that before, right? Like it it was a completely completely different uh, war zones, and you know the number of casualties that were coming back home, right? Because we were able to save more people on the battlefield, right? With you know very traumatic injuries and such, and so the landscape was much different. And, you know, I've always commented that to people, right? Like there was no catch a lift in December, 2005, you know, when we came home, you know, it wasn't until, um, and I mean, I hate to put a hard date, but, you know, I feel like it was around 2010, 2011, when I started noticing more organizations start to pop up that were targeting, you know, the the OEF, OIF warfighter. Um, Mm -hmm. So, right, like you said, it wasn't that people, you know, didn't, you know, didn't care. That stuff just wasn't built in yet. You know, yeah. so I think that is something, though, to to point out. Um, you know, we are blessed now with with many tremendous resources out there. But, yeah, at that time, yeah. there was there was nobody to talk to. Right. And I don't know how you felt, Q, but I mean. I felt so damn isolated mm. and I felt isolated from everyone because, like I said, I you know, yeah, I, I continued to be in the National Guard for another two years or so before I was discharged after coming home, but, you know, once a month, whatever. But my unit was completely gone. That unit, like you talked about that closeness, right? Like we were, incl- we were incredibly close. We were a family. We lived, mm-hmm. slept, ate, did everything out of our trucks together on convoys. And then you're just gone. It's, it's devastating. Yeah. It's a devastating, devastating time. Quintel, looking back you know, on that time and, and, you know, all the, all that you've gone through and the lessons that you've learned, is there any advice you would give to a fellow veteran transitioning from service now? Um, and some of the points where you feel like you're the lowest, go back to where you started. Uh, it could be reaching out to a friend. It could be an email. There's someone that you know that you can just spill the beans to. It starts there. Um, now, more than ever, 10 to 15 years ago, I couldn't go to a veteran and says, there's this resource, there, that, there's yeah. this resources that now I can show resources. Yeah. The swag that you give, obviously, you know, I'll go to CrossFit or I'll go do martial arts and they'll ask questions about it. Yeah. And then next thing you know, they say, well, I'm a veteran, you know. So um, there's some place to start. Um, and I say that because a lot of times it's not that we don't want to say anything because we lack courage. It's just that trust. So yeah. I would say, whatever you're not getting, go look for it or reach out to someone who knows where it is. It may be a support group. Well, if I don't like support groups, do you have a close relationship with your dad? Do you have a close relationship? There's somebody that's willing to walk with you. I remember how I got and I registered through the VA. There was somebody bef- uh, that, that I was close with. Um, as a matter of fact, that I deployed with, hey, man, let's go to the VA and register. Right. Uh, I don't feel like doing it. What's your next day off? Uh, Wednesday. I'll be over at your house at 8 a.m. I'll drive down there. I'll get breakfast. We're going to go down there to register to the VA. The best decision yeah. I've ever made because somebody held me accountable. Held me accountable. Right. And that goes a long way because it was the same. It reminded me of the same environment that we had when we were deployed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for speaking to that, Q. Uh, 
I want to transition gears just a little bit with you. And, and I want to talk about your fitness. And you mentioned, right, you know, the weight gain, you know, after coming home and everything. You've had an absolutely incredible weight loss journey. Uh, would you mind sharing with us about that weight loss journey and talking to us about your success, Q? Um, so mainly it was, so I probably ballooned up to close to maybe 360 pounds. It was in between 360 and 370. Once you get so big, you really don't want to look at the weight on the, the scale. But sometimes you go places, you go to the VA, you got to check in. Right. You got to check on the scale. And so I got sick and tired of hearing them saying, you know, um, oh, you're so big or you got to do this. You got to do that. Um, unfortunately, I let myself go so bad that, you know, um, it transitioned to diabetes and, um, you know, neuropathy and other things happened because I couldn't figure out, I cared about myself, but I couldn't figure out, okay, why wasn't it motivating me or why did I not take it serious? And I think a lot of things, um, well, one thing I noticed about myself when I talk to different Marines or just different veterans, they said, what do you miss most about the military? I said, man, the motivational runs was crazy. Yeah. Like I could run forever because the drill instructor was there pushing you to do it, do it, do yeah. it, do it. And so the rest of my life, no, I don't, I don't need a somebody yelling in my ear, but when I'm working right. out and you know, like yesterday we were doing push presses and my man, I was like, man, Q, man, you ain't bringing it today. What's going on? The yeah. minute he said that, bam, I'm adding weight to the rack and I'm, and I'm going. Yeah. So I started looking for those environments. It started maybe with boxing. It started maybe with, but the thing was, was that as I, my family grew, my budget was limited. And so um, still fluctuating up and down with weight. Um, it wasn't really probably until, cause I chipped away at it over the years, okay. uh, but it wasn't really until maybe around I got out of. So I was medically discharged with PTSD okay. in 2007. And um, I also found out later on, maybe around 18, 19, that I had a minor brain injury. Okay. And so I actually went to SHARE, which is in the Shepherd Center program here in Atlanta. And it was a great program for brain injury. Then I started interacting with other veterans, getting resources and stuff. But part of the things that we did there, everywhere that we go to for how the, the veteran retreats are set up now is that you're very active. And at first it's like, you're thinking like, do I have to be like, why are you trying to make it like a military environment? Right. Yeah. To always PT, but that is the best thing for your mental health. Yeah. And I tell people that. And so once I realized that things started to transform me, it's a, it's a lifestyle. Now it's these habits. It's okay to make mistakes. It's not about being right. It's about getting it right. And then I make adjustments the small adjustments caused the weight to drop. Mm, and that's incredible. I got numerous veterans that told me about catch a lift. And um, it was so popular that, you know, anything that's popular is a waiting list. For sure. But they yeah. said it's well worth it. It's well worth it. Just wait. And so I think I got an email from you that I was accepted in a program out of nowhere. But it was right on time because it was around the same time that I was looking to get into martial arts. Um, and so, um, I was very thankful, um, to receive the support from Cal and then the stuff that I learned, especially from the coaching, um, I have Sean now as my coach, who's also yep. green. And those, those conversations are real interesting because <laughs> as great as we try to be, man, I said, man, I don't think I've ever had a conversation with a Marine and it's been a, it's been a, 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 a conversation where it wasn't foul mouth and, <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah it was just he felt like that drill instructor for me and so yeah. um and so from there still to this day like if you Kyle and other organizations but mainly from you guys you help me write that purpose it's, it's more like hey we're gonna be that support we're gonna be like when you when you when you first learn how to ride the bike and your parents or whoever taught you how to ride the bike tricked you Oh, the training wheels are still on. The training wheels are still on and you're riding the bike. The training wheels are off and you realize you're riding the bike on your own. That's what Catch Lift did for me. Oh, man, that's beautiful, Quintel. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, it's been 
it's been a great joy. It's it's a great joy to get to know any of our veterans, but it, it's certainly been a great joy, you know, to get to get to know you these past Thank couple you. of years, Quintel, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of your, do you have any set kind of fitness goals going forward in the future? What are you working towards now, Quintel? So I love being a servant leader. I might not be the one that always has the right words to say, to stand up in front of the pack, you know, have the most prestigious things to say. But behind the scenes, I love, you know, uh, a hip hop term that we use back in the day, digging in the crates. And so uh, right now, what motivates me more is teaching, uh, whether it's teaching martial arts or eventually helping other veterans. And um, and we've had this conversation like, you know, people think I'm crazy, like use me, you know, and use me as for whatever you need, because I think the best way to get veterans on board is testimonies from other veterans. Oh, absolutely. And so that's what, what I'm interested in. In any which way, I think the battle of being alone as a veteran is a very dangerous battle because they are alone and they don't know yeah. the resources they have or they don't know. All we knew was what we were trained to do. Yep. And so um, I think the biggest thing for other veterans is just knowing like the same intensity, the same training, the same love and loyalty that you had to your job. It's the same loyalty that you can do anywhere else, especially for yourself. Yeah. And I think that's what what I love to to communicate and, and, and do in the future. That's tremendous. And, you know, I think you hit it right on in there, right? Like those of us who have, who have, you know, pulled up out of some of those really bad times, right? Like it's up to us now, you know, to continue to reach out to our brothers and sisters and make sure they know about these opportunities, these resources available that can really, really help them. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so we, we thank you for pushing that message to this community, Quintel, for sure. Um, You know, and, and you touched on it, on it a bit, but can you just talk a little bit more Quintel, just about your experience with the catch a lift program? And what, you know, the, the gym membership and stuff has really done for you and your family. Yes. So it's, it's, it's really has brought awareness, you know, um, first of all, the swag is phenomenal because it does two things. One, I have on my shirt, the motivation that I need yeah. through the models, the quotes, um, just catch a lift itself. Um, my wife likes to steal a lot of the shirts, uh, but that's <laughs> cool, you know, cause she's Marino. So, but, um, it's not just anybody can show up to the gym, um, but what do we do after that? The whole yeah. holistic approach that you guys do with the coaching, um, I'm on the dashboard every other, it was hard at first because I wasn't used to it. Right. But then once yep. it was explained to me, this is the reason why you do the dashboard. Okay, now I'm on it, I'm checking up on it to make sure that I'm caught up on it. But what the dashboard did that motivate me, all the information that I put in there, I looked at it and I said, you know what? That's the reason why they do it. Because I was able to monitor my progressions. Yeah. Um, yep. So, um, and you guys always keep an eye. You guys always, I love the calls out of the blue or the tech, the, the everyday text messages. Yeah. Uh, when I get a chance to, I'm always trying to watch the coach's corner, you know? So it's so many ways um, that is very intentional that you guys do to just keep veterans on the platform of, Hey, we know it's hard, but we're still supporting you. We're not going to give up. We're still, there's this pillar. There's a catch lift is that foundation for us. So. um, Absolutely. Q for any veterans listening that, you know, either, even if they are in the program, but haven't really gotten going yet, or if they're thinking about it and just, you know, nervous about, you know, committing to a a fitness uh, holistic lifestyle like that, what would you say to them? Uh, so most of us feel like when you get the testimonies from veterans and we talk about what we did in combat and what happened when we came back, a lot of us say that that's close to, or is rock bottom for us. So one of the things I say is, well, what else do you have to lose? And then another thing somebody told me, they said the military, as much as it brings to us and teaches us, uh, as far as a lot of the buzzwords that you hear. Um, sometimes we don't become the best patients. So we come home. Oh, absolutely. We, don't, we don't want to go to the doctor. We don't want to explain certain things because we're so protective of ourselves. So we still care about ourselves. It's just that some of us may know, not know how to or, 
it's very intimidating to go out into an environment that you feel like may not support you. Yeah. And so what I say is, is that what is that motivation? Most of us before the military had trauma before combat trauma. What are some of the things that you don't want to do to your family or repeat that you went through? One of the best ways to reverse that cycle is taking care of yourself. Once we're overweight scientifically, even what we feel, it affects our mental health other than our physical health. Um, you know, and then once your body starts to spiral in that direction, other things start to happen. And before you know it, not that you'll get too far gone, but, um, you know, you're like that frog in hot water, or the yep. crack in hot water, you just turn it up a little bit. And then some of us learn the hard way and that's okay. Uh, but we still need to accept that we need to learn and, and physical health. It's the, it's the main part of the octopus before it extends the, the tentacles. This and is so, true. Yeah. You know, it's that motor, the, the word that we use in CrossFit. Yeah. So, um, we got to realize what that is. That's the first place and the easiest place for us to start. Not that it's easy to do, but it's the easiest place to identify. Right. And then you could fix every, anything else from there. Thank you for speaking on that, Q. I have one last question for you today. Okay. Quintel, what does it mean to you to be a Catch a Lift Fund veteran athlete? Uh, man, it means that the first thing that comes to mind is whatever I want to do for the first time in my life, I feel like, and I'm sorry about getting emotional. You're good. I feel You're like good. whatever I want to do, I can do. Yeah. I really do. You certainly can. You certainly can, Quintel. It's been an absolute honor getting to know you, having you on today, getting to talk to you. Thank you so very much for your service to our great country. And thank you so much for continuing to be a leader in our veteran community. We appreciate you so very much. And thank you for your support. Always, Quintel. Always. That's it for this week's episode of Coach's Corner. We will return next Wednesday at 1 Eastern time with another new episode. Thank you so much, Quintel, for sharing your story and your light with us all today. It was absolutely tremendous. Huge thank you to Lynn Coughlin, Henry Pomper, and Kaylee Nasiri for all of the work you do week after week to make this podcast possible. And we thank the entire Catch a Lift team. Don't forget to join us every Wednesday live at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube for a chance to win Cal Swag and a chat with your brothers and sisters. Until next week, keep it real and stay Cal strong.